We are. Woohoo! Wow, it's really weird. Do you see that little participants thing? Uh, yeah, no participant. Well, no participant. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, it dropped down to zero and then it went back up. Hey, everybody. Huh. We had a couple of a, a quick, uh, we had a couple of quick things as usual. Uh, you know, when you get two psychics together, all the alarm, uh, all the electronics go wonky. Um, hey, Sarah. Hi, Annika. Hi, Katrina. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Michelle. Hey, Benjamin. Hey, Elizabeth. I want you to know that that the 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 fact that you didn't get contacted was my fault. Just so you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. I uh, I forgot to send the information that she was waiting for so she could contact you, and that was my my fault. Hey, it's great to see everybody. Look at all these people. Dax is there. Jay and Jessica, Teresa, and Robin. Hey, Robin, and uh, Donna. Hi, Donna. Oh, it's so great to see you, Donna. Um, uh, let's see, Kathy and Ida, Rose and Bonnie and Chris and Andrew and Ryan. Hey, Ryan Montgomery. So great to see everybody. Ryan, I, didn't you take a class from me many years ago? That name sounds really familiar. I think you did. Um, <laughs> it, it's so great to see everybody. Wow, we've got a lot of people coming in from all over the world. That's so mm -hmm. great. Kath is coming in from New Zealand. Wow, that's so great. Oh, speaking of New Zealand, um, which actually has nothing to do with New Zealand, guess who called us the other day, Liv? Who's Ken, Ken Ooch. <laughs> really? Yeah, I heard from him in a long time. Yeah, I know we had a really fun conversation, and, and it was really uh, it was really interesting. I I'll, remind me, I'll tell you about it. Uh, this is so wonderful to see everyone. Spokane, that's where I was born, Cindy. I was born in Spokane. <laughs> oh wow, that's great. This is so wonderful to see everyone. That's great. Wow, people coming in from all over the world. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is so great that people are coming in from all over the world. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and start the uh, Facebook Live. I don't think I'm going to try YouTube this time because, oh, wait, darn it. No, wait, wait, stop, stop. Oh, no, I put it to the wrong thing on Facebook. Oh, no, we have to stop streaming. I have to go to the other one. I put it to the wrong group. Um, let's see, we're going to go to remote viewing with Maury Williams. Um, There it is. All right. Now we should be. All right. We should be broadcasting live to Facebook now. So yay. Hi, Carla. You're new from Argentina. Bienvenidos. Bienvenidos. Wow, that's awesome. Wow, there's so many. They're coming in so fast I can't read them all, but uh, really great. To, uh, Constance, it's really good to see you. Constance, I did not know you were Canadian, or if I did, I forgot. <laughs> well, lots of people we know and lots of new people that we don't know. I'm really happy to see everyone and people from everywhere. It's just really great. This is wonderful. Thanks, guys, so much. Um, so now we're here, and we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. You can ask some questions. Um, one of the questions that we get asked a lot has to do with safety and remote viewing. Like, how safe is remote viewing? And so we might want to address that. Just start out by addressing that before the questions start pouring in, Lynn. Um, talk, let's, let's address, let's talk about the safety involved. Um, like anything, whether you're going skiing or learning uh, martial oh, yeah. art or mm -hmm. anything, you definitely want to have a good trainer. That's, I think, a key to safety. And, and you want to make sure that your trainer is really somebody who believes in safety. And that's one reason I wanted to study with Lynn is because Lynn has always impressed me with how he puts the students first. And he always said, there's no remote viewing session that's worth losing a viewer over. So right. Lynn, do you want to, do you want to talk about why have you always had this really firm resolve not to give people targets like the sinking of the Titanic or the blowing up of the Hindenburg and that kind yeah, of thing? Because, um, you know, when you view a target, uh, especially as a beginning viewer, you tend to get emotionally involved with the target if there's emotions at the target. And if those emotions are mentally disturbing, then your viewer is going to get sucked into those emotions 
and uh, and it's a very bad experience. And that's not learning remote viewing because learning remote viewing is learning how to do it, the steps and all that. And so you give safe targets, targets that are not blood and guts, murder and mayhem and all this. Uh, I know that some trainers will have you have a beginning viewer view the 9-11 uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, some massacre somewhere, some some major you know earthquake or something, and even view the day of their own death. And uh, uh, you don't want that teacher. <laughs> you really don't. Uh, um, another thing that you look for in in a teacher is not only a teacher who won't give you those while you're learning, but as you advance, a teacher who will teach you how to handle those and protect yourself in the process. And, uh, and that's a very major part of becoming a good uh, professional level remote viewer is learning how to protect yourself from the target because some of those targets that you get out there in the real world they're not pretty <laughs> they're that's so true. really not yeah that is really true so i feel like generally speaking crv is really pretty safe and and 99 percent of viewers um you know they they experience it on a level that they don't, uh, they don't go really deep enough. A lot of viewers don't really get yeah. deep enough to to have a like a profoundly scary experience. To be honest, I mean, a lot of viewers learn how to do it. One thing we're we're discovering, Lynn, and I just I was going to just throw this out there. Is, you know, now that we're working with literally thousands of students, um, one thing that we're seeing is there are some students who have never like they got it, they discovered this and were just like, oh my god, like this is real. This is really possible. <laughs> and and then they they try it and they find out they can do it and they're so excited that they, they just keep studying and they're they're doing really great and they come continually to you know everything we offer and uh, they sign up for classes and they they take all the classes and that keeps them super excited like that you know when I started working with you I mean just the thought that, oh my gosh I can't believe I can do this just kept me coming back for more all the time but then there's some people who are naturally psychic and. Um, and so they they start doing it and and it just feels so normal for them that they're just like, oh, you mean this is it? I mean, I've been doing this my whole life. Like, oh, I didn't even, you know, like this is it. And I, yeah. I've had some people who have been nailing targets who, you know, like like where you just kind of go, oh my gosh, that's an eight martini session. We've got to go out and have eight martinis yeah. after that one. And they're just <laughs> kind of unplussed by it, kind of like, oh well oh that's it you know it's kind no. of like are you nuts that was really good so um so i'm we're finding that there's really like two major types of viewers those are the two different ones and uh so it's kind of funny you know how how that that's been coming about um so, somebody asked um let's see here oh let's see let's see where we are oh hector's here from mexico do you remember hector Lynn, from yeah. mexico uh -huh. um is it safe to meditate before remote viewing? Uh, definitely. What do you think, Lynn? Is it safe to meditate? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, in fact, some people keep data and find that they do better right after a meditation. I found that I do better if I meditate before I start. Before I do. I found that also, I found that if I meditate before a session, I do worse. Yeah, and I also found that I do better if I exercise before a session. If I'm doing something active before a session. Uh, but if I do terrible right after I eat, like I should not view right after lunch, that's not a good time for me. So if you keep, everybody's different. Like Lynn, Lynn said, he does terrible after meditating and I do better after meditating. You should keep some data to see what works for you. You just uh, use that four letter word that you just use that four letter word data. But I know, <laughs> let me tell you, I am a data freak. I have just become convinced over all this time. If you record what actually happens truthfully, don't, you know, don't make excuses or anything like that. 
the database is going to tell you what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you need more training at, um, what kind of task to turn down because you know you're not good at it, and what kind of task to accept because you know you are good at it. And it also tells you, uh, I have this track record, and I know that when I give a color, I'm correct 94% of the time. And somebody comes up and says, oh, I don't believe it's this color. You don't, you know, and, and I think you're wrong. Okay. That doesn't hurt your ego because your database is telling you you have a track record of a dependability of 94%. And you just say, okay, well, we'll see. And they come back later and they say, well, you were right, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah, it's really, it's. it's but it gives you faith in yourself. Databasing yeah. is important, yeah. That's, that's great. Um, oh, <laughs> Elizabeth Barrera has a question for you. In your book, The Seventh Sense, Lynn, you mentioned the ambiance portion, uh, the ambiance exercise portion. You mentioned that there are 21 or 12 steps, or how many steps, and how 20, do you get a hold of those steps? 20 steps, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, Lauren Cott up in uh, Canada is in the process of writing a book about the 20th step, the 20 steps of the ambiance exercise but i think she's only carrying it up through the 15th step and the 15th step is one that tells you how to cut it off uh from 16 up to 20 it tells you not how to be sensitive to the ambience in the room but how to control the ambience in the room and uh so i think she's cutting that off there but the um, the ambiance um, thing is that uh, you notice the ambiance, like in where you are. You go into the room and to another room. Don't try to notice the ambiance there. Try to notice the change in ambiance. Okay, it's the change that's important not the ambiance itself. And as you practice that, you get acutely aware of smaller and smaller changes in ambiance. And it gets, you get so acutely aware of changes in ambiance that you can be talking to a person and they'll be telling you the truth and all of a sudden a half sentence there is a lie and, and the ambiance changes and you pick up on it, okay? Or somebody walks into a room and they, they're angry or they're happy or whatever, and you're not even looking at the door, they walk in and all that, but all of a sudden you feel it. And um, so the ambiance itself is not the important thing. It's becoming sensitive to change in ambiance. That's the whole secret of all the ambiance exercises. That's great, and thank you so much. But believe me, guys, I've known Lynn for 25, 26 years. I have bugged him so much about those ambiance exercises. Good luck, good luck on working on that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, I wanted, oh gosh, the, the things are coming in so fast. <clears throat> I can't keep up with them, but... Um, let me just really quickly, oh, what, several of you have asked about the data, and I just want to say that when you are studying with either Lynn or me, uh, both of us have databases on our website set that for our students to be able to log into, and um, and so that's how you that's how you collect data. I mean, if you if you're not if you don't choose to study with us, that's totally fine. Uh, but then you would have to probably keep a manual database or build your own database to keep data there. Um, Lynn, do you? you want to mention anything about the database? Uh, the database is, um, the database that we have is, um, covers, I think, 
20, is it 25, 35 uh, different categories of information types, uh, colors, smells, tastes, textures, and all that. And um, those are, uh, the reason those are in the database is because when you work in operations, those are the things that answer the questions that people ask when you work in operations. And so from day one in training, we train you toward being operational. And um, so I know that other people have taken the database and they have added in uh, ET involvement and spiritual guide involvement and all this, things which are not really firmly databaseable, but, uh, but you know, those are not the things that a business, the police or something like that are going to ask you. And, uh, and so what we track in our database is the things that you will be asked to uh, the types of information you will be asked to provide when you work in real life, real world situations. And so that's, that's why our database contains those fields. Um, and as you, um, as you do a session, then, you know, you have a sealed envelope practice session, you have a sealed envelope, you view it and you say, okay, there is, you know, there's a man-made something and it's red and it moves, okay? On feedback, you look and there's a car that moves and it's green. So you got, there is a man-made, right? It moves, right? Its color is red, wrong. And in doing it this way and by, by pulling these things out, the database will actually tell you, hey, Lori, give me some targets in colors because I need more work in colors, okay? And it helps you guide your own training, your own exercise, your own growth. And uh, so that's why we have the database the way it is. Yeah, and ours is really built a lot after Lens. It has the same categories and everything. And uh, it just, it's only slightly different in that we wanted to be sure that we could differentiate between operational targets and practice. And we also made a way to differentiate between your level of, of, of training, like basic, intermediate, advanced. Those are the only real differences as far as content goes. Um, yeah, but and, uh, database, it's still the same categories of perceptions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's the same. And then, um, and then in the seventh sense, you spoke of attractors and distractors during a session. You suggest that having an attractor can draw the attention of someone who is remote viewing you. Can you speak to any attributes you've discovered that make an attractor effective, like spinning objects or something like that? This is Benjamin. Um, during a session, you suggest that having an attractor can draw the attention of someone who is viewing you away from you. Okay. Yeah. That's what the attractors are usually done for. Like the um, Russian high command uh, is firmly aware of psychic spying. And they believe it. They do it themselves. And so um, many of their totally above top secret, you know, uh, special access meetings and all this, they will hold at carnivals or at, uh, or at a theater while a symphony is going on, something like this, rather than in a room where you have the secret meetings because they know that any viewer coming in will be attracted away to the carnival or something like that. And so, uh, yeah, the uh, attractors used for, for when somebody is viewing you are actually used for drawing their attention away from you so they don't view you. <laughs> right. this, is, this is a way of protecting yourself, yeah. 
<laughs> uh, someone thought you said Martian High Command. It's Russian, Russian, Russian. High Command. Russian, yeah. <laughs> Russian High Command. Um, uh, how now, now? How to get better at CRV and ARV is a huge question, Jay. I mean, that's like there's some we could spend the, uh, two hours easy, talking about that. No, easy answer. <laughs> Easy answer. Okay, give them the easy answer. Practice, practice, yeah. practice. <laughs> exactly. The answer no one wants to hear. Is it? That's right. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Also, uh, and, and Mary put a link to the Astonishing Legends interview, guys. This is, this is you know, interviews can often be boring and just the same old, same old. Like, how did you find out about CRV? And, you know, well, you know, the same old questions. This is not the same old questions. This is really, really different. Uh, yeah. Scott Philbrook and Forrest for guests from uh, Astonishing Legends have studied CRV with me and they ask some very deep, profound questions. So it's really worth listening to. Um, Annika asked about when, you know, when you're viewing and you have something, you, you always said, if you, if you would turn your eyes away from something in reality, like blood or something, then you'll turn your mind away from it at the target. And we you found will, that to you be will so tend, true. You will tend to turn your mind away. Yeah. Right. Yes. That's the tendency. Yeah. So in, in training our students, we try to train them to, you know, over time, we don't do this with brand new baby students or yeah. basic uh -huh. students, but over time, we try to gradually give them a little bit of tougher targets. Like um, there's a, a, a train crash target that didn't involve any any deaths or any injuries or anything. Right. It was a, a train crash target. But um, and Annika said that she felt like she was turning away from that when she was trying to view it. Well, she yeah. says, how, how do you, she said, how do you get your subconscious mind to stop avoiding something that's the crux of the target and you're describing everything around it? You know, how do you keep that from happening? Oh, uh, I hate to go back to the practice, practice, practice thing, but that's a major part of it. But a major part of it, um, as you practice these targets, because, you know, at a higher level, we do give these targets to students because they're going to be working in the real world and it's the real world is messy. And uh, so we will, like you say, introduce them to a target where there is some mayhem, but no, no danger or anything like that. Nobody hurt and all. And uh, then have them uh, recognize the emotion. Okay. They feel, Oh, I don't want to do this. Okay. Recognize the emotion and then go through the lengthy set aside process to talk themselves, to talk to themselves about it like they would to a small child, you know, and, uh, uh, to, to come to terms with it and then barely tap on it, get one impression, and then back out. And no harm. Okay. Next practice session. Do it again. Get a couple of descriptions and back out. Pretty soon, you realize that no matter how horrible that target is, you have a way to keep from getting hurt by it. And and we also teach you uh, how to detox, how to detoxify your own emotions that you pick up from the target and all that. And so um, it's by practice and slow training. And uh, like when I went into the unit, uh, some of the first targets I got were prisoner of war targets. Very bad. And uh, and so I was thrown into the deep end. And I don't believe in doing that to people. <laughs> it, it was not fun. I'll tell you, it wasn't fun at all. No, no, no that's really that's not good. Um, uh, yeah, I, I also think that when it comes to viewing something that's unpleasant that you don't want to view when, uh, you know, initially I had a real problem with height targets. And yeah. Lynn just, I just viewed height target after height target after height target after height target after height target for so, you know, for a long time until I literally became desensitized to it. And eventually I got to where I became really good at height targets. Initially I couldn't view them at all. 
And Lynn would give me something that involved height and I could do everything except for the high part. That's when he became aware that I couldn't do heights. But eventually I got to where height targets became a strength because he just kept giving them to me. And the thing about it is you, you have to really have a lot of stick to itiveness and determination to become a world class or really good remote viewer because you're going to come up against things like you just mentioned, Monica. You're going to come up against stuff that you don't want to view or that you don't want to experience, you know, whether you have claustrophobia or fear of heights or whatever, you're going to come up against that in some way at some point. And, and some people, what they do is they freak out and they run away and they never want to look at remote viewing again. So it takes somebody with a lot of metal, you know, strong metal to push through that and continue going at it and going at it and going at it. And one thing I'm seeing too, is that a lot of people struggle with impatience. They want the instant, thing they want the instant you know I, I you know instantly i want to view the martians on you know on such a planet or whatever and that you're not ready for that yet you have to have time you have to take the time and work through it to where you can get to the point where you can view those with some degree of dependability <laughs> you have a phone ringing <laughs> yeah. throw the phone out of the room <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and then Martin asked, this is a good question. Martin asked, um, does learning ARV help you get better at CRV or vice versa, or do they work against each other? I don't think they work against each other, but Lynn, what, what's your opinion as far as does learning ARV help you get better at CRV or does learning CRV help you get better at ARV? What's your opinion? Any practice you do helps you get better. Okay. Uh, now there is one problem that makes a conflict between ARV and CRV. In ARV, you're viewing what your feedback's going to be. So, you know, if team A wins the game, my feedback will be this. If team B wins, my feedback will be this. View my feedback and see what I'm going to get, and I'll know which te team is going to win the game. And so you view your feedback. In CRV, you try to never view your feedback. You view the actual target. And uh, uh, many people who do the ARV say, no, you're viewing an actual target. And, uh, and they wonder why their accuracy isn't all that good. In ARV, you view your feedback. The reason you don't view your feedback in CRV is because the people who give you feedback, like it's classified or it's a uh, secret to what a corporation is planning and putting money into, they're going to lie to you. They're going to give you a lie for feedback. If what you view is your feedback, you're going to give them a lie. <laughs> right? mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. uh, and so a person who goes into ARB almost full time gets into the habit of viewing their feedback. It almost completely ruins them for being a CRVer. However, a person who practices ARV learns to view their feedback and practices CRV equally learning to view the target equally, it's like they're learning Spanish and English, okay? They're learning two languages. You switch over to one, you do it. You switch over to the other and you do it. And so there's no deterioration between them. But anybody who focuses on ARV to the extent, to the major extent, it's not going to be a good CRV. -er. Anybody who focuses on CRV and then they go into ARV and say, okay, I'm viewing the target, but the target this time is a piece of paper with the picture on it. That's my feedback. I'm going to view that piece of paper. Then CRV helps you with ARV. But, um, but in ARV, you have to distinguish that you're viewing your feedback. And in CRV, you have to view the target. 
That's that's the only distinction, and that's the only conflict between them. Yes, and Mary, if you if you go on to the website where uh, it talks about <clears throat> classes and gives information about each class, there's a description of what ARV is and what CRV is there that will, I think, help people who are asking about the difference between them. And that's pretty much it. I mean, to me, this is the way I often tell people is that CRV to me is kind of the granddaddy of the remote viewing techniques. And yeah. it's my pref preferred one because it's like a basket that can hold all the others. You can use ARV as a tool within CRV. You can use ERV as a tool to get information that maybe AR, that CRV is not great at getting. But <clears throat> to me, CRV is the structure that holds them all. And that brings us to another question that was way up the, up well, the link. Well, along this line, CRV is for getting any information at all. ARV is special purpose. That's or true. getting future probabilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. ARV is for for predicting the future. That's his main purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and another definition of ARV is it's the controlled use of time loops. That's what A yeah. that's what ARV is. It's the controlled use of time loops, and time loops we find exist all throughout any type of remote viewing. But when you use do ARV, you're actually controlling those time loops so that you can get information that will help you make better choices or know which stock to, to sell or buy or know which 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 course to bet on and that sort of thing. Right. Uh, um, <clears throat> now, what you know, there's a ton more questions that we can answer in the time we have. But I just want to uh, one question that came up was about structure. Someone mentioned that there are teachers out there who've taken the complex structure of the military method of CRV and have simplified it greatly. And isn't that, isn't that good? Isn't that a good thing to, instead of it being weighed down with the thick structure of CRV? And, oh, I, don't uh, think it, I don't think it hurts anything. Um, and you know, if you learn the simplified structure and you practice it, you're still developing your abilities, your skills on a simplistic level. But then when you get to complex targets, that's where you're going to need to take what you've learned and learn the more complex stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And also, um, I, you know, one of the things that you used to drill into me, I remember so heavily, is that the structure, the complexity of the structure was done purposely when they were developing CRV to give right. the conscious mind a job to do. And the, right. the conscious mind is busy remembering where to put things on the page and things like that so that the subconscious mind can come through. However, we have found, like I have several students who have had closed head injuries who have a very bad short-term memory because the result, their short-term memory was damaged. Yeah. And they literally cannot remember the structure, yet they're amazingly psychic. And so I created templates for the yeah. structure that they can just kind of follow the template and they do great. They do amazing sessions. Um, yeah. I also have students for whom, you know, the structure just isn't maybe it's just a little bit harder for them. And so, yeah, I mean, then then you could take some shortcuts if if it were if it, if you found that it still bore just as good a fruit. That's the thing. Yeah. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. Right. That's if, right. if it yeah. produces accuracy and dependability. Great. If it doesn't, then you better go back to, you know, square one and really work on the structure. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um. Let me see here. Okay, now, as far as talking about missing 411, that's kind of an individualized question, so I'm going to skip that one. Um, but okay, let, me, it does let, me add something, let me add something to that previous one. About that, that structure? Yeah, uh, about the training of a simple structure versus, you know. Yeah. When you take the simple training, you're going to learn the terminology and all that and the the theory behind it and everything else. When you move to a more complex structure because you've grown some, don't take the terminology and, and all that with you. Learn the new stuff. Learn the new terms. Learn the new stuff. And don't keep trying to translate everything back into a simplistic form. Because if you do, you're never going to get the details. Mm -hmm. So learn the new stuff in the new way. And don't try to drag the old stuff with you and keep interpreting into the other stuff. Okay. 
Yeah, that's a good thing. I'm sorry. Buick, Buick Mumchi. Hi, Buick. You know, I've had a few conversations on the phone many, many, many years ago when we were still living in Texas. But um, he asked, which is more reliable, viewing when awake or in twilight zone sleep? And if you're talking about controlled remote viewing, I, I'd like to just address this for a second because I've, I've always been a dreamer. I've had precognitive dreams that were extremely accurate and have come true my whole life. So I think your question really depends on the person. I've also done very complex remote viewing sessions using the structure of CRV to get extreme detail. And the difference is when you get a dream, you have a dream, you're just being handed information. Sometimes you don't even know, like you, you view a disaster, you view someone dying, and you don't know who's this person, where does this happen, when does it happen, I don't know. Whereas with CRV, you can aim it and control it and get information you know, on demand. That's a huge difference. So to me, it's great to have uh, reliable precognitive dreams, which I've had, mm -hmm. but yeah. at the same time, I, they're totally, it's almost like trying to compare a hammer to an apple to me. Right. They're very different animals. So yeah. you can't say, well, well, this is better or that's better. They do two, two totally different things. They have two different functions completely. That's right. And so that's. Yeah. Point. And uh, the thing is with, with dreams quite often, you are more psychic in that hypnagogic state than in the, you know, remote viewing state. And so you may get better information, but it doesn't get written down. And so what gets to people afterwards is a summary of what you got. And if you're doing it in a remote viewing session, you write it down as you get it. And so everything gets written down. Plus, like you say, uh, you're going along and you say, oh, it's red. You can ask yourself, why is it red? Oh, now then you just found something about the target that your subconscious knew, but didn't give to you. But you can find detail, detail, detail. And as a result, instead of a one paragraph summary of what you got you may have 20 pages of highly detailed information so that's the difference but uh which one is better yeah exactly it's hard yeah. to say it's really hard to say um uh, and now here's a question that's near and dear to my heart that i just have to address very quickly uh, Lori, you mentioned in the past that you learned CRV while raising a young family. How did you manage to finish CRV sessions in the midst of your busy, busy life? My my house was chaos. We had literally, at one point, we had 28 children in the house. And I had a really crazy full-time job running a refugee program. So what I learned to do was to always keep a target with me available. Because back in the olden days, we had to glue targets onto paper and then put yeah. them in envelopes. And so I literally would carry an envelope with a target in it and paper and a clipboard and a pen with me. And then I would be at the dentist office waiting in the office and I would do a session. I would be on a plane and I would do a session. I'd be waiting somewhere for, you know, for something. And I would take every advantage to view. I even viewed while I would go for walks. I don't recommend that in a busy place, but we were kind of out in the country. So I would take walks and view while I was walking. The neighbors probably thought I was case in the joint because I was writing and walking at the same time. But um, I also learned to view in short interrupted bits. So I would view for 10 minutes and the kids would be like, mommy, take us to the park. And I'd have to take a break and put break and then the time. And then I'd go to the park and I'd resume at the park. I put resume at the time and I'd view for another 10 or 15 minutes. Then I'd have to break again. And so I, cons I had to learn to be able to continue have a continuation of my viewing abilities through multiple interruptions all the time because I got interrupted constantly. And the hilarious thing is when the last kid finally moved out of the house, Lynn and I were on the phone and you said to me, Lynn, you said, now the challenge is going to be see if you can remote view in a quiet environment with no interruptions. <laughs> and it wasn't easy, was it? No, no, that's not how you true. learned it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, but I did have to just take advantage of every little little bit of time. You know, it's what is the the saying that uh, you know if you if you're really determined, you can do anything you want, right? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Then did you find a question that you you were looking at the questions? Did you see something? Yeah, uh, Liren asked. Um, um, was it? Uh, actually, started. Okay. Uh, 
Practicing out-of-body experience with the Monroe Institute Hemisync technique can develop your CRV abilities? No. They can, however, develop your psychic abilities. CRV is a structured methodology and doing the out-of-body experience, you, you develop your psychic abilities, but you still come back and give a summary. The uh, CRV abilities are developed by practice, practice, practice. And uh, so, uh, so the out-of-body hemisync technique, oh yeah, I, I recommend it. It develops your psychic abilities like crazy. But your CRV ability, no. You learn and you practice. You get training and you practice, yeah. Mm -hmm. And several people have asked if you could give um, a quick, uh, just address detoxing, like a, you yeah. know, a brief, a brief method of detoxing, yeah, or a brief uh, explanation of how to detox this money. Okay, <laughs> and um, detoxing for natural psychics is very hard, very difficult. Uh, for CRV, it becomes very easy because, <clears throat> excuse me, at the bottom of your session or at the bottom of where you've accessed a person, you are feeling their feelings, you're aware of their feelings and all this. You start at the bottom and you realize that as you have met with them, you have sort of, you know, entangled yourself with them. And so you start at the bottom with the last impression and you say, is that them, their impression, or is that their feeling, or is that mine? Oh, it's their feeling. Ah, uh, you just broke that one. You go back to the impression before it, is that their feeling, or is that mine? And you sort of unzip yourself from that person. And because we have everything written down as we get it, we can very easily work backward and unzip. And it's very easy to detox because this way you are mentally separating yourself from that other person going backwards to your first contact with them. Yeah. And so in CRV, it's very easy to detox uh, for natural psychics who have gotten uh, themselves all emotionally and, and, you know, even spiritually and mentally entangled with the target. There's no structured way to actually do it. And so it becomes a very difficult method. Yeah. Yeah. And Claire, the answer is definitely, I think CRV is really helpful for managing yeah. natural psychic ability. I was naturally psychic and I fought it like crazy. And I, I, if people ask me, are you psychic? I'd be like, no, 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 I'm not psychic. But I, it was wild and uncontrolled. And CRV gave me a really safe platform to crawl out on. And Lynn was the very best teacher I could have had because he was very patient and yeah. really helpful as I crawled out on it. He was also really patient with my attention deficit disorder, which later got diagnosed. I didn't even know I had it. But now I think back to Lynn trying to teach me, and I wonder how he didn't just go, ah, get out of my house. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, but it is it's it's really a wonderful safe way to 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 learn to control your your abilities. It's it saved me in so many ways. It really really helped me from just wild psychic stuff that would happen all the time. Yeah, um, it put you. The thing is, controlled remote viewing is not controls on the viewer. It's the viewer has control of the viewing. Exactly. Yeah, you're not a controlled. Yes remote viewer you're a viewer you're a remote viewer who has control yeah okay now several people have asked this so we should probably answer this question there's a lot of people asking about being remote viewed you know like how do you protect yourself from being remote viewed and how often do you think that, that happens and why would that happen or you know what are your opinions about so many people being afraid of someone remote viewing uh, one thing you have to realize is that um, nobody is 100% accurate. 
And so somebody remembered Regardless of you, what they say. <laughs> regardless of what they say, yeah. And uh, so remote view and you, they're going to get some stuff wrong anyway. But uh, also, um, a lot of people feel like the government is spying on me and all this. And uh, listen, if you think the government is that concerned about you, go into a government office and try to get some help. <laughs> they don't care about you. You know, and uh, um, the thing is, though, that if somebody is trying to uh, remote view you, um, for if they're a natural psychic or if they're using sort of a homemade remote viewing method, it's generally very easy to protect yourself from them uh, because you can just throw up all kinds of... Uh, uh emotions you can set up attract uh attractors around yourself uh um you know get some um okay you think the the person is sexually oriented toward you okay and they're trying to view you fine Get a statue of a naked lady and send it over to the side of you. They'll view the naked lady. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and this is how attractors can, can protect you. But, um, uh, the, uh, the thing is that most people are not so much afraid of being remote viewed as remote influenced. And, I've been in this for, what, close to 40 years now. And I can tell you from personal experience, there may be five people in the world who are capable of doing the remote influencing. And the others, they're just pests. And uh, and the remote influencing may may... You may feel it for a moment, but then as soon as they quit, you ignore it and it's over. Uh, and as far as the uh, thing of remote control, it's not there. It's just not there, people. It's really not. Uh, uh, um, people making you do things and all this, it's, it's really just not there. Uh, it's it's hype. Yeah. So um, yeah, I but think your, that it happens. Your greatest your greatest problem in that is your own fear. Mm -hmm. You have nothing to fear but fear itself. That's exactly right. I feel like fear is the biggest enemy. And when I first met Lynn, I was so full of all kinds of fears. I mean, I brought a lot of fears in with me, and CRV has really helped to eliminate a lot of those. I'm a lot more relaxed than I used to be. <laughs> But uh, yes, and so I um, I think that too. A lot of times, people fixate on negative stuff and fears. Yeah. Their fears, and by fixating on, you know, there's there's a, a saying that says he feared a fear and it came upon him. You know, yeah. it's like you track those things to you. That saying, I think that's actually yeah. a verse in the Bible. He feared a fear and it came upon him. You know, it's like that's an ancient belief and it's true. You attract it's those things. Old. Was the old thing is that the guilty person is runs when nobody chases. Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, and so let's see. I'm just looking. Do you? I know there's a ton of other questions, but there's so many comments it's hard to find them. Oh, and Lynn, could you address psychic slumps? Yeah. <clears throat> Having full and experience. That's, folks, oh, wait, let me just say, folks, that's slumps, not slums. Pavel called it slums, but it's slumps. Slumps, <laughs> yeah. having, had, having had many of them myself uh, and uh, and keeping data when I did. One of the things that I found out over a long period of time was that <clears throat> when my viewing and my psychic ability went into a slump, if I gave up, it was over. Okay. If I continued on, 
what would happen is I finally figured this out over long experience. My conscious and subconscious mind seemed to be working something out, rarely ever having anything to do with remote viewing, something else in life. And so you go into a slump, you work your way through it, you say, okay, I know from all my slumps, I've got 25 dog meat sessions, just do them, get them out of the way and all this, you know, and work your way through it. And you come out of that slump and you always go to a higher level of proficiency. This is definitely plateau learning. But something else in your life is going to get fixed. And, um, and whatever was happening between your conscious and subconscious mind, when it gets worked out, you get your remote viewing ability and your psychic ability back, but something has worked out in your life and your life is better for it. And so, uh, and many times I'll go into a slump and I'll, I'll welcome it. Yeah, I'll welcome those dog meat sessions because I know that at the end of them, I'm going to feel better. I'm going to be healthier. My life's going to be better. Something that is suppressed and hidden in my subconscious mind is going to get worked out. Yeah. Yeah, I just, um, <clears throat> another thing about slumps too is that it's just, it's slumps are, a, are like an indicator, like when the baby starts to sit up or the baby starts to crawl, they are an yeah. indicator of development, of, of progress. And I heard something last night that was so helpful. This, um, this guru in India was talking about how, how when we, we think we're going through something and we're like being a very unspiritual, like we're, we're like when I, when I go through it because I'm like so immersed in business and I don't want to be immersed in business. I want to be immersed in spirit and spiritual things and good things. How all those phases of our lives are all a part of our evolution toward transformation. And That's they're right. all they're mm -hmm. all good for us. You know, all these things are good for us. So slumps are really a good thing. And now that I regularly tell my students that, they are all passing through slumps very victoriously and, and you yeah. know, coming out on good. the other end, uh, you know, so much better. So that's slumps can really can really be good. Um, Mary put a link in there for us a, a little a little article I wrote on slumps, I think. And then um, Rose says, since taking the RV, CRV class, I feel better. I'm still doing spring cleaning. CRV is a great way to learn about yourself. That is for sure. I've learned so much about myself through CRV. Um, <clears throat> so really, really important. Um, I, I feel like we missed some really important questions that were way up, way, way, way up there uh, because they were coming in so fast. I, I was missing a lot. Did, did we miss some? Uh, Oh, and let's see the strategic. Okay. Um, oh, I think you already addressed that. Let's see. I'm just trying to see some other ones. Oh, a, a quick, a quick tip on finding lost keys. Connie asked that way, way up the thing, like <laughs> finding lost keys. I have to share a quick story. I was uh, coming to my office and a woman was waiting outside for me and she introduced herself and she said she had lost her keys and I had an appointment like in five minutes. So I couldn't help her very much. But what I said was here, Grab it. How many stories does your, she said, I know they're in my house, but I can't find it. I said, how many stories does your house have? She said, it has two stories. I said, okay, grab two pieces of paper, divide it into quad, you know, quadrants, each piece, label it like top floor, north, you know, bottom floor, north. And I said, and then just use a pendulum or something. You know, I explained to how to use a pendulum to get a yes or no answer. Um, and if you're curious about that, there's a free class on the website called Secrets of the Ancients that teaches all this stuff. But you can literally do what we call quadrant dowsing, where you just say, "Is are my lost keys in this corner? Are my lost keys in yeah. that corner? Mm -hmm. And you just move. And that's a really fast way. And the woman called me that night and she said, I found my keys. I did it. And I found my keys. So, <laughs> so that's just a quick answer on finding lost keys. And the reason I'm addressing it, even though only one person asked, is because how many of us have ever lost something that we're trying to find in the house? Yeah. And we can't find it. Thank goodness for the pinging feature on the phone. So you, know, you oh, can yeah. ping your phone. Uh, another thing, and this gets down to the principle of keep it simple. Uh, 
many people say I lost my keys and uh, I'm trying to view it and you know I get my keys but you know that didn't tell me where they are and I say well where are you trying to view and I say the keys and they say the keys I say but you know the keys if you're wondering where your lo- where the keys are don't view the keys view the location <laughs> yes yes yeah that's really great and, that's a great you know, just very simple yeah um have you ever worried for your safety because of what an adversary may have remote viewed uh, in the military we were aware that the russians and others were looking for us yeah mm-hmm. uh worried no oh uh, but um you know worried about what they viewed no because you know i i'm too old to do anything to be ashamed of <laughs> you know um uh, Oh, uh, so I think the answer is no on the worry part. Concerned about being viewed. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that uh, we did in the unit was we learned how to protect the information because you know I wasn't always in the remote viewing unit. I was in top top secret special access programs all my military career and i have information in my mind that you know is is still top secret and i have learned how to protect that uh so that anybody who um tries to get that information is just going to get scrambled garbage and uh and there's a technique for doing that that it's too complex to go into here but um uh, but you know i've been concerned about people getting that information and what they might do with it yeah and so yes and so that's um as lynn just mentioned it's it's he can't go into how to protect it right now because it's you know that's a that's probably also not only is it probably too lengthy for right now because we've already run out of the end of the hour but also uh, it's probably techniques that you would have to be pretty well advanced to be able to do anyway. Uh, But I can tell you as a witness that years and years ago, uh, Lynn was talking about having protected that information and uh, one of the students decided he was gonna try to see if he could access it. Do you remember that Lynn? Yeah. Uh He tried to access it and ended up in the hospital. He got really, really sick and, and ended up in the hospital. So it, I can tell you that it works. What <laughs> the, the technique Lynn <laughs> used works. It works, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, and so, um, oh, and then Bonnie just asked, can you simply instruct yourself to view only and not get pulled in emotionally? Yeah, you can instruct yourself to do that, but then as you view, you have to stay aware of your own emotional state of oops i'm getting sucked in and you have to learn the constructive use of taking breaks the constructive use of of pulling yourself out of getting you know emotional entanglement with the target and um and so it's not just a thing where you say in front of this session I'm not going to get involved and then you go into the session and you know um no it's a it's a thing you have to constantly be aware of as you do the session yeah that's great so we are just about out of time but i just want to say that uh we have uh, i have a live three-day arv workshop coming up february 8th 9th and 10th which is Gosh, it's a week away. Uh, it's just a week mm-hmm. away. So if you want to, if you're interested in ARV and you want to, you can go on the website. Uh, Mary, if you're still there, can you pop in the, uh, you can pop in the, the link to that. Um, it's on the website, uh, on the calendar. So if you just go to intuitivespecialist.com, 
Um, there's that. And then also, Lynn, you have to, can you tell everybody what you have? People ask me all the time, is Lynn still teaching? What can I, what can I do with Lynn? Yeah. So tell us everything you're offering. I have an ARV course, which is not a hands-on, let's go out and bet on the games and all that. Uh, Marty Rosenblatt has that, and it's pretty effective. Mine is a sort of a collegiate educational course about what ARV is, the theory behind it, the history of it, the various different methods on how to do it, how to keep the database on it. And so it's a study course. And I have a pre-course video that tells you all that and warns you, if this is not what you want, don't sign up for it. And people sign up for it and then they want, you know, they're unsatisfied because they don't pay attention. But um, <laughs> but then I have the basic CRV course. I now have the intermediate CRV course. Uh, and right now, uh, the students who have taken basic with me are going through the uh, uh, intermediate course. When we finish this, since it's the first iteration, we're working out all the kinks and everything, you know. And when we finish this, then Lori's students, Coral's students, uh, Michael's students, um, you know, and uh, Paul O'Connor's students and all that, uh, people who have gone through a valid CRV basic course will be able to go through the intermediate course. And uh, the intermediate course right now is 16 weeks long and uh, involves, it's going to wind up, I'm adding sessions as we go and as we work out the kinks, it's going to wind up like 100 and probably about 150 lessons. Uh, I know the uh, the basic course has 165 lessons. And uh, uh, so, so that's what I have right now. I have planned to do a monitors course, a CRB analyst course, a project managers course, and um, a database managers course and all this, but that's far down the road, you know. May you live forever. <laughs> I hope, yeah. Because <laughs> those are so needed. Those are really needed courses that you would definitely be the best person. You really are. Nobody's teaching them. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. They are really, really needed. And uh, I teach a live version of those. Uh, I teach a live, a monet, I, I'm sorry, not a monitor course, a project management course, an operational yeah. course. But I mean, literally teach it once a year. And uh, and it's, yeah. you know, so people never really, really um People never really realize how important it is and what a better viewer it makes you to take that course. It's oh, really yeah. something. Yeah. Uh -huh. I have yeah, I have students who told me they didn't want to take it, but then when they did, they were so grateful and said it was one of the best courses yeah. they had taken. Um, I do want to say that it's it's really we try Lynn and I work really hard to make sure that the classes are interchangeable. Like if you took basic from me, you could take intermediate from Lynn, take intermediate, I mean if you take basic from Lynn, you could take intermediate from me, so that they're interchangeable. And Lynn's courses are, are really great, and you can sign up for them, um, and you can take art mine too. If you're really into it and you want to really get a, a real thorough take on stuff, you can do both. It's great, and uh, we're, super, we're super happy to be offering that. Um, I do want to say the ARV course that's live, we do actually do, um, you know, you, it's hands-on, and you go do things, and we've had that's students. I'm really, glad. Yeah. The last class I taught, we had a a lady won $450, another person won 300 and something. It was really fun. Um, uh, so it's, you know, it's, it can be a lot of fun. It, ARV is a lot of fun. I just encourage people not to just get too much into it because I don't want them to lose their CRV abilities. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. And so, so if, you yes, wanna, so, if you want to learn by doing, go to Lori. If you want the, <laughs> the scholastic collegiate thing about ARV, that's what I offer, and uh, and I try to warn people ahead of time, and uh, uh, you know I just I just had somebody sign up for PayPal, and then 
they wrote to PayPal and say, said that I was a fraud. They want their money back because uh, we're not doing any A or B thing, betting on games and, and the stock market. And, you know, I warn people ahead of time. Um, I do want to tell people, too, that uh, what was I? Oh, yeah. If, if, if Freddie's asking about the this webinar. Can he download it? Freddie, um, we, what we do is we leave. The, there'll be a replay in the remote viewing with Lori Williams group. And then as soon as the whole thing processes and we have a link, uh, Mary uploads it into Vimeo. We upload it into YouTube. We send it to Lynn so he can upload it to his YouTube channel. And so you can watch them whenever you want on YouTube or Vimeo. Um, I don't think you can download them though. You can just watch them when at your, you know, at your pleasure. You could save the link and watch them whenever you want. Screen right. captured. <laughs> screen, <laughs> screen captured. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, that was yeah. You could use a screen capture like Loom. Is it Loom? I think it's Loom does screen captures. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I I, I don't know. I don't know if you can download some YouTube sometimes lets you download things. Yeah, Freddie says he has his ways. Well, good. Yeah. Because <laughs> this is free. We want everybody to have this information, so no problem yeah. with that. Thanks, guys. Uh, we'll go ahead and sign off now. We've, we're eight minutes past the hour. Uh, yeah, I hate banning too, Lori. I, that, that's my least favorite part about ARV, but it can be really fun if you're in a group of people and everybody's working together and doing stuff that's yeah. fun. But thanks, guys. It was great talking with you. We'll be back next month. We'll, we'll post the announcement, and I'll put it out to all the groups and on the Facebook groups and stuff, and you'll You'll find out when the next one will be. Yeah. Talk to you later. See you then. Bye-bye.